President, what did you mean by your Puerto Rico comments this morning? Mr. President, are you committed to Puerto Rico for the long term? And there you have President Trump leaving a room in the White House where he was flanked by members of his administration, a few key members of Congress, and also some small business owners there, signing an executive order, taking matters into his own hands when it comes to health care reform. We're going to talk about what the impact of that executive order might be in the long run. Let's talk now with my colleague, Mary Alice Parks. She joins us live from our Washington, D.C. Bureau. How you doing, Mary Alice? Good. Hi, Amna. Hey, and we also got Alex Mallon with us. He joins us from the White House North Lawn. Hey, Alex, how's it going? Great. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. So he was so excited about it, Mary Alice, he almost forgot to sign it, the most <laughs> important part of the whole deal. But let's talk about some of the details in this because it, there's some broad strokes there in the announcement. What exactly is happening with the executive order? What is it asking federal agencies to do? I think you hit the nail on the head right there. The big headline from today is that despite uh, the appearances of a big change, nothing new really happens today. There's no new rules or no new regulations or changes in regulations that go into effect. Instead, the president was asking federal agencies to consider changing the rules. So there's a little bit of a question of grandstanding here. Uh, now, the federal agencies do have a lot of power to potentially change the rules very dramatically, but we'll have to keep uh, uh, keep keep our eyes peeled for what changes they might actually put into place. Some of the things that he's suggesting, um, the idea that small businesses and perhaps even self-employed individuals could band together and form associations to have essentially more market, more uh, negotiating power in the marketplace when they're dealing with health insurance companies and they're trying to, uh, to, to get plans at lower, at lower cost, whether there would be um, more market power if they could band together. The big question there is whether the federal government will say that those new plans that they negotiate will have to meet the same standards uh, of, of, of current law of previous um, iterations of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, I can go on. There is, there's um, the idea that they might allow states to continue to offer um, smaller, more bare-bones, short-term plans um, that tend to be cheaper, if they might be able to offer those for longer periods of time. Um, again, some of these, uh, these, the president asking for federal agencies to consider some of these changes, uh, some of these possible changes down the road. So there's Alex here. A lot of sort of the language is, is important. There's uh, agencies considering or looking into possible changes. There's a lot of could have, maybe down the line. These things will happen. But we know we've had a chance to hear from some uh, administration officials on background. Uh, we heard the president there talking about the fact that millions and millions of Americans could find relief in some way if these things were to go into effect. Do we have any idea how many people would be impacted, how they could be impacted? Are there any, is there data analysis going into these proposals? I mean, that's what we pressed these administration officials on in that background call. And they didn't really have any answers. They didn't have any answers on exactly when uh, any of these policies that the president's putting forward for asking these agencies to consider might even be put into effect. And they also were asked whether the agency agencies had a chance to review any any data points that they could provide us, uh, whether they've, they've asked it asked about what this would mean for any of these Americans that they say are being burdened by Obamacare and, and they just didn't have them. So really, I mean, we haven't even seen the text of the executive order yet, so it's really just not clear uh, how, how Americans would be affected. But uh, opponents of this, you know, are quick to say that the more that you offer these bare bones plans, as Mary Alice was pointing out, uh, the, the more that there's so much more uncertainty as to what would happen to the marketplace as a, as a whole. Uh, I mean, that, that is really what has been, uh, or insurers have said uh, since the start of the Trump administration has been the driver of premiums that have been increasing is this uncertainty that, that they really do not know the future of the ACA. So really it becomes difficult to put any stock into how they want to care for these plans and, and, and continue to offer affordable and quality health care 
for, uh, for, for regular Americans. And Mary Alice, obviously that uncertainty is something we've been talking about for a while when it comes to the larger insurance market, just about what will happen with insurance in America has led to higher premiums across the board in some cases. But one thing we do know for sure about the way insurance works, when you offer another option for healthy individuals to save money and buy into and pull them out of the existing marketplace, that means the burden goes back to the people who actually need more comprehensive coverage. That has been a tension point throughout this entire debate. That's right, and it's sort of an intellectual debate taking place in Washington and around the country. There are people that say if you offer smaller, more uh, bare-bones plans, then you will bring premiums down for people that are okay with that. Uh, it tends to be healthier, younger Americans that just don't want to pay for larger, more extensive coverage. But the result can be, exactly like you said, uh, that people that need fuller coverage, uh, that want more robust plans, could end up paying a lot more. Um, it's a gamble, uh, whether what, how it will play out, what works, how, what the impacts of the market will be. In a lot of ways, um, what the president is suggesting is a return to uh, to, to the health care landscape before the Affordable Care Act, where you did see um, for people that needed more coverage, but they were buying it on their own, paying a lot more, and others able to buy uh, much more bare bones options. This is uh, something uh, worth pointing out here, Alex. I want to ask you about this because the optics of today, here we had President Trump surrounded by some key members in a small room signing this executive order that could potentially bring about changes. Think back to May for just a moment when the House GOP pushed through its version of an initial GOP health care reform plan that never ended up going anywhere from there. There was a huge Rose Garden reception. All of the GOP members of the House were bussed in and surrounded the president. There was a lot of clapping and celebration. We're seeing that picture right there. Alex, it's very different optics. And, and it strikes me that from the messaging of repeal and replace, repeal and replace, it now looks like they've moved to do what we can incrementally just to undermine the existing system. I mean, but the president isn't saying today undermining. He's calling this the actual beginning of repeal and replace. But now if I, if I look back to that Rose Garden ceremony, I, I probably think we could dig up a soundbite of him saying that today is the beginning of the end of Obamacare. So really, uh, it, it's, 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 I think we've seen the president now reckon with the fact that he's not going to be able to do this right now with Congress. So just as you said, yeah, it's, it's really now uh, his mission to figure out how he can undermine it to a point where Congress has to act, where he believes that Democrats will have to get on board with some kind of version of what he can call repeal and replace. Because then this past weekend, after we uh, saw that the president called Chuck Schumer last Friday, uh, he tweeted that, you know, I'm actually going to work with Democrats now on a way to fix Obamacare. And, and, and the, he, the president was asked to clarify exactly what that meant. Was he abandoning repeal and replace? He said, you know, Democrats can call it whatever they like it, uh, whatever they want to call it. I'm going to call it repeal and replace. But Democrats have said squarely that any idea of, uh, of them signing on to a repeal and replace effort uh, just even if the administration goes as far as to label it that, they are not going to be on board with that. But another thing I just want to point out about the, the attendees in that room, which kind of struck me, was Senator Rand Paul, who's been the leading opponent in, in the Republican Party uh, of President Trump and the Senate GOP's efforts to repeal and replace on, on, on several fronts. Um, but he, the president pointed out in his own remarks, uh, he said, when you get Rand Paul on your side, it has to be progress. Now, exactly what the rest of the Senate GOP thinks of what's going on today, whether it's going to push them to act sooner, uh, that is, uh, again, up to, it remains to be seen. All right, so Mary Alice, <laughs> here's where you jump in with the answers. What does the rest of the GOP think about this? Well, I think it's really interesting that Rand Paul uh, observation, too, because the president at the end of his remarks brought up tax reform. It's clearly on his mind the next big ticket item that he really needs Congress to get done. Republicans agree they need to pass something in this first year. And there's been a lot of talk that Rand Paul might be the key to getting tax reform over the finish line. He's been one of the biggest critics on some of the tax proposals to date. So it was this a uh, 
behind the scenes background way to make sure that Rand Paul comes to the table on tax reform. We'll see. That's really interesting. It will be something to watch. And what do the other Republicans think about this? You know, that's a great question. I, we saw a lot of Republican lawmakers in that room um, excited that the president was taking this step. But it's really interesting that in the past they were incredibly critical of former uh, President Obama when he would take matters into his own hands, when he would, would sign an executive order and executive action to do something that the Congress had failed to do. They said that was uh, overreach on behalf of the White House, overreach on behalf of the president. But now when it's their guy in the White House, they seem to be all for it. So it's going to be a lot of questions for lawmakers on the Hill, whether it made sense for the president to take these actions, whether they will make a big difference, and whether they even agree with, uh, with the content of them. And Mary Alice, it's worth pointing out, their guy is also tweeting about it. We know just a couple of days ago, he said, look, if Congress is not going to act, I'm going to take matters into my own hands. We see that today with him taking the pen, signing that executive order. There you have that tweet, since Congress can't get its act together on health care, I'll be using the power of the pen to give great health care to many people, all caps, FAST. So is this how the pressure continues to go, Mary Alice? He's just going to take incremental steps, do executive orders until Congress has to do something about it? Perhaps, but I do. I think that it's just so ironic to ha that tweet where I just think we have example after example of when the president said that this was inappropriate of previous presidents to do exactly that. So it's a real reversal from this administration to now say that that he can take matters into his own hands when Congress has not been able to act. Uh, it's just remarkable. And whether it's the next step, the next uh, sort of era of the Trump administration, perhaps uh, I, he wouldn't be the first president to get frustrated when Congress can't get something done, but uh, but whether it actually brings Democrats to the negotiating table, whether it actually uh, it sparks a fire under Republicans to pass some repeal and replace legislation, uh, that just remains to be seen. The, 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 the proof is in the pudding, and we, we just don't have enough details yet about how exactly some of these executive orders will play out. And we could be a long way away from that yet. Mary Alice Parks, Alex Mallon, thanks for being here, guys. Thanks, Thank Alma. Thanks to all of you for watching as well. Remember, you can head over to abcnews.com anytime for the latest on this story and many others, or download the ABC News app. Get all those breaking news headlines and updates right to your phone. For now, I'm Amna Nawaz, and I'll see you back here soon.